Join me in this responsive greeting this morning. The love of God enfolds you. May it teach us to enfold others in the same love. Morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Janelle Kurtz leading in worship this morning. Jim Bolm on piano, Tom Lafferty leading our choir and congregational singing. And Mike Manley is our liturgist helping us to hear the word of God. We all come together with our hearts before God in praise and worship, remembering that it is the community gathered that offers and does the work of worship together. I'm going to take a moment at the start to get ahead of it. You'll see me when I am not speaking wearing a mask. I am well, but folks in my household are not. And so out of precaution, I'll be having my mask on. So that's what that's about. Couple of announcements. There's more information in the insert in your bulletin for more information about those. I want to highlight two things. One is that this morning's lunch and learn, we're going to go and I invite you to get some lunch down in the fellowship hall. Our program is going to be in here because it requires Zoom so that we can communicate with Pat Rudd, who's helping to facilitate. And so the easiest setup is going to be using our screen. So I invite you to have some lunch and then return back into this space for our time together at 1130. And then I'm going to highlight uh, preschool trunk or treat fall festival one of our goals for this year is to work on partnership and particularly partnering with our preschool and offering outreach to the families there and so at the end of the month we're going to do a fall fun festival for them. And I invite you to join any way you can if you have time to join us if you want to help plan games or you have treats, you can offer that are nut free, we would welcome those and so there's more information in the bulletin about that too. Those are the announcements that I'll highlight this morning. But let us remember there are many ways in which we are the body of Christ alive and at work in the world. And I invite you today, we are starting a series where we will continue, we'll start today and over the next four weeks, we will read Paul's letter to the Philippians and we'll hear it alongside Valerie Kaur, who is an activist, her uh, book, see no stranger and so our theme is around seeing no stranger and how is it that we learn to love beyond all the things that seek to divide us and make us seem like strangers to one another and so this morning we begin with the what really matters it is a question that we will sit with and as people of faith that i hope we sit with often of what really matters in our faith i invite you to listen for that and how spirit moves within you Worship in whatever way is best for you to connect with the body of Christ and with God. I invite you to rise in body or spirit at this time for our call to worship. Good morning. Come to this space and remember what is good. We know the great commandment of love. We know the prophet's teaching to do justice love mercy and walk humbly with god yes this is good but this goodness longs to live in us not as words we speak but as actions we take come to this space and remember what really matters justice that breaks the silence and moves our feet toward liberation mercy that gives compassion and bridges every gap between us, every us, and every them. Love that dares to wonder and sees no stranger. Come, live the good you seek. Praise God, the source of that goodness. Our first hymn this morning is in the Praise We Sing book, number 2175, Together We Serve.
Let us join in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, you have given us your instruction through the law and prophets and Christ himself. You have shown us again and again what is good. And what is good is that we live your great commandment of love, that we seek love through justice, that we love, let love shave, shape our tender mercy, that we set love free to liberate, reconcile, and make all things new. Remind us that love enfleshed in our flesh and bones is what really matters. Help us to choose this way again. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, we hear the beginning of God's letter to the church in Philippi. God is writing from prison, and I shudder to think what prison must have been like in Paul's day. From prison to call the Philippians to rejoice in the gospel. He reminds them to stay focused on what really matters. Hear this opening address from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I hold you in my heart. For all of you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how long, how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what really matters, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the progress of the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and ri rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. These are holy words for all God's people. Thanks be to God. And now, children? I think, they're, I think they're all home. Ah, okay. The choir. The choir is next.
Beautiful choir, thank you. Well, Mike, you still have one more job to do. I know you are running back and forth. But I will say that that song and hearing choir sing it, I could not keep from singing. So I just did a mic check to make sure it was off. And I sang anyways. Paul's letter to the Philippians continues. He shares how he has chosen what really matters in his own faith. Though he looks forward to life with Christ beyond all death, he is committed to serving God with his life here and now. This is a reading from chapter one, verses 20 through 30. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now and always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet I cannot say which I will choose. I am hard pressed between the two, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for the, your progress and joy in faith. So that by my presence again with you, your boast might abound in Christ Jesus because of me. Only live your life in a matter, manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you 
or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and in no way frightened by those opposing you. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for God has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of God. Thanks be to God. You know those things that you do every day in your life that you almost do without even thinking? Well, I have a routine for when I get in my car. I turn on the ignition, and then I immediately reach for the radio to turn it down, like crank it as low as it possibly can. Now, this is in part because I'm one of those people that think better without the radio at me. And when I get it, I need to remember where I'm going. But it's also because my car has this very annoying habit that I don't know how it has, which is no matter what level the volume was on when I turn the car off, some of you are nodding, your car has this habit too. I would turn it on and it blasts as loud as it can. Yeah, wow, a lot of your cars have this habit. I think of it like the hose that has water stored up in it, so you turn it on again and it's like whoosh. I don't think it's possible with speakers, but it does it every time. So turn in the key, turn down the radio, and then put on my seatbelt. Good to go. So I do this the other day without even thinking. Crank the radio way down, I start driving, and as I go, I finally settled in, I know where I'm going, and I'm like, okay, I can listen to the radio now. So I go to turn it back up, and the volume doesn't change. It is just low enough that I can hear something is happening, but not loud enough that I can hear what it is. And so it's just this like buzz, and it's really not important, but really bothering me. So I try again. Turn up the volume. Nothing. So I go, okay, maybe it's on my phone. So I turn up the volume on my phone because I was trying to sync through that. Mm, no change. All right, I'll turn it off. I turn the radio off. I turn it back on. Still no change. And at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start arguing with the car. That will surely work. Come on, please work, I say. You know, the irony is I was trying to listen to a song that helps me calm down. And I was like, I really need it. Could you please work, car? Still nothing. I am driving while this is happening. And I am now going into the settings. And I'm like, forget that my phone ever existed. Like, forget the device. I'm going into my phone. I'm turning off Bluetooth. I'm like, I'm just going to play it through the phone itself, not the car speakers. Still not working. And then I see that as I turn up the volume again, it's telling me, an icon shows up on my, on my dashboard screen that says that the volume is increasing, but it's for the map and not the music. And I'm like, well, that's great. I don't even have a map on. This is not going well. So I keep doing all these things. And then finally, finally, I'm like, I'm going to call Kevin. He can fix it from afar. Or, if that doesn't work, I will maybe confuse my car enough that it will remember what it's supposed to be doing. None of these things work. And the only thing getting louder now is my arguing with the car. Until I get to the point where I say the most mom thing ever, don't you make me pull this car over. I will do it. I swear I will. And I swear at this point the radio laughs. I mean, I can't know because it's too quiet to hear, but I'm sure it's laughing at me. But finally, I do what I should have done miles ago, and I pull the car over. 
I should have done this miles ago because, like I said, I was driving this whole time fussing with the radio, which doesn't make for the best driving. So I pull over, take a deep breath, and then like three more because I needed them. I turn the car off, I turn the car back on, it still won't work. I do everything besides give it a swift hit, which might have been the magic key now that I think about it. And at this point, I take a few more deep breaths, and instead of arguing with the car, I turn the argument back on myself. And some of you, a lot of you have seen me, I talk to myself out loud with regularity. Any Sunday morning before worship starts, you'll see me wandering around just muttering to myself. And so I turn the argument back to myself, and I say out loud, I say, Janelle, you need to drive now. This is not worth being late over. You really need to focus on getting to where you're going. That's what really matters. And I repeat it like four times because I am not ready to do that. And I go and I go, nope, don't even reach for the volume. Just keep your hands on the wheel and focus on driving. That's what matters right now. When I can finally do that, with some confidence, I again pull out, finish my drive to wherever it is that I am going. And my morning kind of unfolds like that. Lots of teeny tiny, really insignificant, but still really bothersome things happen. So by the time I get home from all the things I'm doing in the morning, running late to drop off, fussing with this radio that won't work, barely getting in and out of the places I need to get to, going to volunteer in my kid's school where I'm again late and getting coughed on and all kinds of things. I get home and I finally take a deep breath and I say, okay, it's time to write the message. I open my laptop and I remind myself, what is the passage again? Ah, Philippians. What does Paul say there? Ah. This is my prayer, that your love would overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what really matters. Oh, <laughs> what really matters? Well played, Holy Spirit. Touche. I see what you did there. I can barely drive 10 minutes through my neighborhood some mornings without getting distracted from what really matters. How then, how am I supposed to be receiving Paul's invitation, Paul's teaching to pay attention to what really matters in my life and in my faith? In this letter, Paul is writing to the community at Philippi and he is thanking them. He is in prison, and so the, the folks in Philippi, they have gone, they sent him a letter, they sent him a messenger, they sent him resources, maybe even food, to help sustain him while he's in prison. So Paul is writing back this letter, and he's saying, thank you, thank you for that care. But with it, he invites them to pay attention to what really matters in their community, too. He is grateful for the prayers and the gifts and the service that the community has given to him. And he says, make sure, too, to focus your prayers, your gifts, your service on the community where you are. That's what really matters, too. And so he asks them to think about it. What really matters for the gospel where you are? Because Paul is very clear on what matters for him. And this is how I know, by the way, that I am still being perfected in love by God. It's because I think of a broken radio as a minor annoyance. Paul writes here and is like, yeah, I'm in prison, but it's okay because the gospel's being proclaimed. I'm like, oh, okay, I have a long way to go. If Paul is like, imprisonment is okay if the gospel's proclaimed. And I'm like, nothing's okay until my radio's working. <laughs> I have a little ways to be perfected yet. 
in love. But Paul is clear. He's so clear. That's what matters for him is that the gospel is proclaimed and he will find a way to celebrate that even from prison, cut off, isolated, in fearful, hard, dark, difficult days. He will celebrate there. Not a forced happiness because he thinks that's what he's supposed to do, but a real, true, genuine rejoicing that the gospel is boldly proclaimed, is lived out in communities around him. And it is indeed dark, hard, difficult, fearful, isolating days. You hear that in how he writes his letter, right? He says, he's very clear, I don't know. He says, living is Christ and dying is gain. I'm hard pressed to choose them. Oh, it would be better to depart and live with Christ in this great life beyond this life. He says, it is more necessary for me in the flesh to remain. More necessary for me for the gospel, more necessary for God's kingdom come that I stay engaged in it, in these hard, difficult, isolating, lonely days. Paul is clear on what is most necessary, on what really matters in his faith and his message. And so he chooses to stay in it. He remains in the work and he writes and he strives and he sacrifices and he serves with every day he has, with the body he has been given, with the gifts that are his to claim. Because this, he says, is most necessary for the gospel. This is what really matters. And Paul writes to the Philippians and he challenges them to choose likewise. To stay, to remain engaged in what really matters, even in hard, fearful, difficult days. And there's some evidence that the Philippians were experiencing at least a bit of that. And he calls them to stay in it. He calls them, what is it that evidences a life worthy of the gospel? What is it that proclaims God's kingdom come as real and alive where you are? That is most necessary. That is what really matters. He calls them to stand firm in Christ, to live in ways that they can with their own flesh, their own bones, their own gifts, their own days, their own hours. Serve the gospel. My friends, beloved church, this is a challenge for all of us still who claim the name of Jesus. To stand firm in faith. To stand firm in Christ to live in ways that matter with our flesh, our bones, our days, our hours, our gifts that we have to to do the most necessary thing that really matters in proclaiming the hope of God as real and alive in our world. The question Paul asks us again is what really matters where we are? To what will we give our energy and our time and our attention, our talents and our voice? How is it that we will choose to stay in the kingdom work here and now? Because, my friends, I think that some of us might say these are too isolating and fearful and dark days sometimes. And it can be easy for us. I'll say for me. I'll just say for me. But I think maybe for us. It can be easy to make my faith small or make it saved for a heaven far away as if God's hope doesn't impact here and now. But God's hope does impact here and now. God doesn't leave it as it is. God seeks the hope of what is new and life-giving. And so we know the right answers. 
don't we? We know the right answer to the question, what really matters? We know Micah, the prophet who tells us to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. We know Jesus' great commandment of love, to love the Lord our God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and body, to love neighbor as ourselves. We know the right answers. We know what really matters. But I dare say that sometimes, at least for me, it is easier to know the right answer. It's easier for my mouth to say the right words back and far harder to let that truth live in me. Our new bishop, Bishop Cedric, has a saying. He says, if you can't say amen, say ouch. My friends, I will say ouch. It is sometimes far harder to let the truth we know live in our bodies, live in our lives, than it is just to proclaim it with words. We know the temptation to relegate God's kingdom to a place far away when God's kingdom wants to come here into these days. I dare say we know what it is to start out driving down the road of love and get distracted along the way by the difficulties of life by the difficulties of loving real people. We get distracted along the way with saving the church as we've always known it, as if that is the only way God's love reigns in the world. We can get distracted down the way, even though we're driving in the way of love, we can become distracted with what it is that is most nice and respectable and inoffensive, as if that is always the same as loving kindness, as if it's always the same as mercy, as if it's ever the same as justice. We can get distracted as we drive down the road of God's love by what neighbors will think or what others will think or by the loudest voices in the room, or simply by the discouragement of the day. Until other things get our full attention and we find ourselves pleading with those things, all our passion and argument and energy going to those things, when what really matters is that we keep driving down the road of love. Do we not sometimes forget what really matters? I do. To do justice as more than a yard sign or a social media post or a button, to love mercy, the kind that forgives, oof, that forgives, that imagines a way of being community beyond the way we can imagine community right now. To walk humbly with God, not just on Sunday mornings, but every morning, every evening, every time in between. To love God, not only in creed or Him, beautiful as they are, but with heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. To love our neighbors as ourselves. Our neighbors, like Paul, locked away in prison. Our neighbors whose bodies we ignore once they become unkempt our neighbors who are sick and shut in, our neighbors who are grieving, our neighbors who know violence in their own homes, our neighbors whose language is not our own, whose ways are not our own, but whose humanity is always our own, the same as ours. Sometimes I'm driving down God's road of love and then the radio quits working. And I forget what really matters. In her book, See No Stranger, author and activist Valerie Kaur teaches about practices for revolutionary love. And we're going to draw on her work. It's a, it's a big book. It lends itself to far more than we can ever cover in four weeks. And we're going to try at least pieces of it. We're going to hear that along with Philippians. But this is what she writes when she is talking about how it is we continue in love. 
she writes that wonder. Wonder is the wellspring of love. If we want to love others, we must first and always wonder about them. This is, this is what she writes. Seeing no stranger begins in wonder. It is to look upon the face of anyone and choose to say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. It's easy to wonder about the internal lives of the people who are closest to us. But it is harder to wonder about the people who seem like strangers or like outsiders. So when we choose to wonder about people we don't know, when we imagine their lives and listen for their stories, we begin to expand the circle of who we see as part of us. We prepare ourselves to love beyond what evolution itself requires. See, wonder is where love begins. But the failure to wonder is the beginning of violence. Once people stop wondering about others, once they no longer see others as part of themselves, they disable their instinct for empathy. And once they lose empathy, then you can do anything to them or allow anything to be done to them. Entire institutions are built to preserve the interests of one group of people over another, and they depend on the failure of imagination. They depend on the failure of wonder. My friends, we know that there are plenty of people and powers in our world that want us to fail at imagination. The powers of evil want us to fail at wonder about one another. Because once we do that, then it's really hard to live into the great commandment to love one another. There are a lot of things that are ready to distract us from what really matters. So beloved church, beloved friends, this is our challenge this week, is to be people who are willing to still wonder. Wonder about one another, wonder about our community, get curious in the places we might be afraid. All distractions of self, all distractions of fear, all distractions of ego aside, it is the work that really matters. So this week, let's wonder. Wonder about where injustice might live. Imagine how we can show up to bring justice in that place. Wonder where mercy might be lacking in our neighborhoods. Imagine how you can show up there with loving kindness, forgiveness, and grace. Wonder. Wonder about how it is we can continue to walk in humility with Christ before us. Imagine if you walked a little closer in step with God. Wonder about the neighbors you don't know yet, those we're called to love, the stories we don't know, the voices we don't recognize. Listen to them. Imagine what happens if they are part of you. I'm closing, but this week, Jim sent me a reflection. He does this from time to time. And there was a line in it that really struck me. It's by Reverend Elder Miller Hoffman. And he talks about faith as a litany of decisions all day, every day. On Sundays, we might think about faith as a litany, period, that which we call and respond to each other, the hymns we sing. And yet this is a call for faith to be a litany of decisions, day by day, the decisions that bring us into a further understanding of love, that bring more people into community, that make the kingdom of God embodied here and now. That, dear church, that's the work that really matters. That's the life that's worthy of the gospel. By the way, for any of you who are wondering, I went about my day and I kept driving my car and I kept focusing on what really matters, which was driving. 
Sure, a couple dozen times, half dozen times, I went to reach for the volume, and then I said, no, don't do it. And I kept focusing on what really matters. And I don't know how it happened, my friends, but somehow my radio healed itself. <laughs> and I laugh like you laugh. But I'm also a theologian to my soul, and I think to myself, there's a parable there. That if we live as people of faith so focused on what really matters, maybe all that is broken will be restored and made whole. And if that ain't the gospel, I don't know what is. So my friends, let us live our lives in that way. Amen. I'm going to invite Tom to give us instructions for our next song. Let's stand for 2174 into the round. Everybody on this side is number one. Number two, the choir will be number three. It's the round. We're going to go all the way through it once, and then we'll start the round. You may be seated. Listen, I'm moved by it. Whatever we did, I am moved. It is the time in our service where we offer our gifts, our prayers back before God. And so a reminder, the yellow prayer cards in your pew, if there is a prayer you'd like to raise for our community. Otherwise, as our ushers come forward, again, the reminder that the way in which we live and give all of the time we are not here, the litany of our faith, the decisions we make day by day, these two are gifts back before God. And so let us give and live generously in all the ways we can. Would our ushers come forward, please?
gracious God, we give thanks to you for the ways in which you and Christ showed us what really matters, love that restores and redeems, mercy and grace that makes new. And so may the gifts we give and may the full of our lives go to that same witness to bring your kingdom into reality here and now. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Continue in a spirit of prayer. These are the prayers of our community this day. We continue to hold Lynn Reynolds in prayer as she remains in the hospital, and we give thanks for family who have been, who have been able to be with her along with friends. Lord, in your mercy. Jody Burnson reminds us, invites us to um, prayers for a nephew and his wife, Alan and Ashley, for the loss of their baby. Ashley was five months pregnant. Lord, in your mercy. Adam A. Aiken invites pr prayers for her sister-in-law, Diana, who's in the hospital undergoing testing. Lord, in your mercy. Karen Manley invites prayers for her neighbor, Heather, who is struggling with kidney function. Lord, in your mercy. A few folks invite us to continue in prayer for Dick Walker and Ellis Walker. Dick fell and it seems had a mini stroke. He's in the hospital. He and Ellis both also have COVID. Then a few others in our congregation have COVID as well. So we remember Dick and Ellis and others who are not well. Lord, in your mercy. And Deb Haynes offers praise that her surgery went well this week and prayers for the illness to come under further control. Lord, in your mercy and grace, hear our prayer. And a joy from Karen Manley that her grandnephew Emery, who we've been holding in prayer, is beginning to have new uh, blood cells from his mom's stem cell infusion. That is great news. Yeah, Deb, I saw you do that. Deb went like this, and that is all of us right now, or ought to be. Lord, in your grace. Lord, listen to your children praying. Remember that children of yours are praying throughout creation. Creation itself prays its prayers, its groaning in disaster, its praise in the grandeur of nature. Lord, listen to creation praying. Give us ears to listen to. Lord, for your children spread around the world who are praying, praying despite violence, praying despite outbreaks of war, praying through diagnoses, praising you in the joy of each new morning, praying desperate pleas in hopeless places, Lord, hear their prayers and help us to tune our hearts to hear one another's prayers too. To remember that they are not apart from us, but are simply parts of us we do not yet know. Lord, for your church and all the prayers that it offers to you, for all the ways in which your church has been a beacon of hope and life, In the midst of them, let us not forget that there are ways that church has also done harm and seeks to do better 
because that is the healing and reconciling work that your kingdom calls us to. Lord, for all those praying in our community here in this space, those who are with us, though they can't be in this room. Lord, there are many prayers we raise on our hearts. There are so many we've named this day. And there are those in the silence of our hearts that we pray for your healing. We pray for your listening ear. We pray for mercy, for justice, for a new creation to spring forth. Lord, listen to your children praying. We pray with the confidence of those who remember Christ, who remember that we are the body of Christ, that we are those who you hear because you are God with us. And so we pray confidently and we live confidently in the witness of Jesus before us that we would be those who not only have the right words, but the right ways of living that really matter to bring love in the flesh to all the places where love is not yet known. We pray together as Christ taught us in whatever words or language we know it best. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, My Life is in You, Lord, number 2032, in the faith we sing and on the slides. let us go this day to remember what really matters as we live the call of faith to be people of love.
May our lives be a litany of decisions that witness to that faith day by day. Let us go in peace. Amen. Thank you.